commercial free Catholic charismatic channel. He's strengthening the faith of so many people. To promote the gift of church teaching, dedicated for the new evangelization. God's blessings on your work, may God bless and prosper you. Shalom World, God's own channel. Blessings to all of you. My name is Father Peter Jankowski, Father Pete. I am the pastor of the second oldest church in all of Northern Illinois, St. Patrick's Church in Joliet. Our church was established in 1838 and I thought in this beautiful nature setting with this flowing water that is behind me, it would be very appropriate to talk about the growth of the church in Illinois where I live. I think it's a great model and a great metaphor for how God's grace ends up coming throughout the entire world. It would be very appropriate to talk about the growth of the church in Illinois, where I live. I think it's a great model and a great metaphor for how God's grace ends up coming throughout the entire world. I was thinking when I was researching this subject for the University of St. Francis, when I was teaching church history, how I learned that when in 1818, this state was established as the 24th, 21st in the Union, the Illinois legislature wanted to find a way to provide resources for those who are going to live in this state to be able to survive. In order to do that, they commissioned uh, the work of building a canal, a man-made canal that would extend from Lake Michigan and going southwest as a means by which barges and other vessels could bring these supplies to those who wanted to live in this state. But the legislature also realized how difficult it would be to provide, uh, to create this canal. And so they needed to hire out many, many workers that would be able to create this task. In order to do this, you needed to have people who are willing to live out in a natural setting, to live out in the wilderness, to forage ahead, which would be quite difficult to do. In the meantime, many Irish, many Germans, many French from Europe wanted to come to this new world, but realized that this life would be difficult and they may not be accepted by those who already lived here. In fact, of the original 13 colonies that established this country, only one of the 13 colonies truly was accepting of immigrants outside of England and that was the colony, the state of Baltimore. The second Lord Baltimore, who governed the colony uh, in his name, uh, decided that he was going to be a welcoming governor. He was going to welcome those from other states, from the Catholic tradition. He was gonna welcome them into his colony to tell them that they truly were people of love, people who were going to be accepted. And so the Irish and the French and the Germans who did not have the resources at home in order to survive made the long travel across the pond to uh, Maryland where they were able to find a place to live and be accepted. And it is not unusual to know that uh, Baltimore, Maryland, became the first diocese in the United States and the first bishop, John Carroll, uh, was commissioned to serve in Baltimore so that this uh, grace of God could be established in the new world. The Irish and the Germans and the French all found their entryway into this colony. And when in 1830, the Illinois legislature uh, dis, uh, created legislation to build this canal, uh, those from Europe who could not find a place to work decided to make this long trek into this part of the country in order to build that canal. Now life was very difficult. When you don't have the resources, when you don't have food, when you don't have the basic supplies to live, it would become a very difficult uh, project to begin. But these immigrants 
They wanted to establish themselves here. They wanted to begin a new life, and they needed help. They needed assistance in order to make this life possible. Meanwhile, during this time, as the church began to grow and began to spread, we're actually told that between the years 1800 and 1850, the Catholic population in this country grew from 200,000 to over 2 million Catholics, according to the Catholic News Service, according to uh, uh, nationwide uh, studies. It became so large that the need for priests to serve in this area became paramount. At that time, there was a diocese established in the city of Vincennes, Indiana, Nowadays, we, call, uh, we have a, a diocese called Indianapolis. In Vincennes, in, uh, Indiana, the bishop at the time, S uh, Simon Gabriel Brute, he was assigned to serve all of Indiana and the eastern third of Illinois, including Chicago, which wasn't established as a diocese until 1843. Gabriel Brute needed so many priests to help and there were so few at his disposal. It is said that he even went back to France to commission priests to come over to assist him in this good work, in this good ministry of serving souls in the area. One of those priests was an Irishman named John Francis Plunkett. Francis Plunkett was from Ireland who came to this new world because he knew that God's grace needed to be spread in this country, in this state, and so Bishop Brute commissioned Father Plunkett to serve here in this part of the world. But he was alone. He was alone. There were not many priests that were able to assist him. So in the one and a half years that Father Plunkett was here in Illinois, he established over two dozen parishes in this community from as far north as Bensonville, far south as Kankakee, far east as the Indiana Barter, far west as St. Charles, he built these parishes so that the people who were building the canal, the people who chose to live here, would not feel like they were alone. It was said uh, through the uh, historical records that I had uh, investigated that he would even have to carry a bullwhip with him because not only were there no clergy in the area, but there were also no police, no law enforcement. So uh, Father Plunkett weared more many hats during his ministry. He lasted for a year and a half. He started so many parishes and he offered so much love. But a year and a half into his ministry, Father Plunkett, in the middle of the winter while riding a horse, fell off his horse when he hit a tree branch and he died and the people were without a pastor. Bishop Brute sent a second priest to come and serve at St. Patrick. His name was Jacques Maurice Saint Pelay, a priest who ultimately served as the second bishop of Vincennes, Indiana. For the short time he was here, uh, Father Pelé, Bishop Pelé, was able to continue the good work of Father Plunkett and pass on this ministry to the eventual vicar for the diocese, Maurice Dupont de Vice. Maurice Dupont de Vice served this parish until 1844, and during his time, he continued to minister to the two dozen parishes that made up this area. The parishes began to grow. The parishes began to build their churches. The parishes knew that there was a priest that cared for them enough that he was willing to ride on horseback from city to city, making these long journeys, these long voyages, to tell people they were not alone. Father John Inglesby was assigned as pastor of St. Patrick's. He lasted here for six years. Father uh, Inglesby was from New York. And when he came to the United, when he came to Illinois to become pastor of St. Patrick's, he was just newly assigned a priest, newly ordained a priest in 1844. And as a gift, he was given a church bell by his friends over in New York. That church bell served as the only means of communication in the city of Joliet at that time for people who did not have police, that people did not have fire departments. It was the only means that people would be able to communicate with each other was with that bell. Father Inglesby lasted in Joliet for six years and as was said, he wanted to travel west to uh, minister to those during the time of the California Gold Rush. When he left, it was said that he wanted to take the bell with him. 
And as story goes, the people were so enamored and so attached to that bell that they had placed a guard at the base of the uh, church tower to make sure that that bell would remain in Joliet to protect the people. The next pastor, Father George Hamilton, had the daunting task of splitting the parish in two. When he split the parish in two, it became obvious that the church had grown so much that the Germans who were attending St. Patrick's wanted their own church. They wanted their own place of worship in a language they could understand. And so a neighboring church was established, St. John the Baptist. The pastor at the time, Father George Hamilton, wanted to rename the church St. George. And so he did for the eight years he was there. And then when he left, Patrick, Father Patrick Farrelly came and he renamed the parish St. Patrick. But it was a difficult task. It was a difficult task because when the parish had split, the parish did not have enough resources in order to sustain itself, and the parish became very poor. So Father Farrelly and Father Walter Power switched parishes in 1869. And Father Walter Power came to St. Patrick's from Freeport, Galena, Illinois. He came to St. Patrick's to re-establish the church. When re-establishing the church, he even went so far to sell his horses, to sell his horses to the people of the parish so that they would have enough money to build the parish back up, which they did. And the parish began to boom, and the parish began to grow once again until 1917, when Cardinal George Mundelein from Chicago decided to split the parish once again in two. He commissioned an architect, Charles Wallace, to build identical churches, both in a new location for St. Patrick's and a church one mile north called St. Raymond's. Two young priests who had just left the seminary together, uh, Father Francis Scanlon and Father Philip Kennedy, both lived together while these churches were being built. And they established two new parishes to serve the people of the Joliet area. The parish of St. Patrick's, which was now on Marion Street, its current location, and the Church of St. Raymond, which was built one mile north. Church of St. Raymond in 1949 became the cathedral parish of the diocese. And meanwhile, Father Kennedy, Monsignor Kennedy, stayed as pastor of St. Patrick's for 43 years. During those 43 years, the church grew, the church prospered, the school had seven, 800 children that attended. Uh, the Catholic Church knew that this, inst uh, this growth was necessitating the growth of Catholic schools to teach people the faith, which Monsignor Kennedy did so well. But as all things, as Monsignor Kennedy passed away in 1961 and as Vatican II took place, the church became transitional and the church needed to serve the needs of a new generation of people. And this new generation of people, the Hispanics, the Blacks, the Asians, I'm told that the church in Asia is the largest growing church right now in the world. These new immigrants also came into the United States and they needed to be served. So in 2006, I was asked to come to St. Patrick's to uh, establish Hispanic ministry, to minister to those people of different cultures, of different uh, languages, to make sure that they knew that they were being loved, that they were being served. And so I came to St. Patrick's with a daunting task to continue this immigrant tradition, to make sure that people knew that they were loved, that they were cared for because that's what St. Patrick's has done for the last 179 years. We have been a church for the poor. We have been a church for the immigrant. We have been a church for people of different languages and different cultures to tell them that they're not alone, that they are being loved. And so over the last 12 years at my particular church, I have worked with a great number of people who lovingly have given of themselves to serve this parish. And it's a blessing, but it's a challenge because we've learned that over the last 10 to 15 years, the percentage of priests to parishioners has become just as daunting as it was in the 1850s when we had so few priests with so many parishioners. But now today, with the growth of priesthood, with this new wave of priests coming into the church in the United States, we have hope again. We have hope again knowing that the church can continue to grow.
And the blessing that we have in the United States is that in so many different parts of the country, we have such a growth taking place, but there are so few priests, which is so important for us to keep uh, pro uh, promoting priesthood and religious life, to continue telling people that we have those in our communities, those of the next generation that are willing to serve. And it's been a blessing that so many people have come forward, but it's a challenge for us to continue promoting these vocations. And as I continue telling you my story, on my story of how priests from various countries have encouraged me to uh, soldier forward, to offer this grace of God to the people that we serve, it's been a blessing to me. It's been a blessing to me to serve and to meet so many different people in the seminary. Uh, the diocese which I serve sent me down to Mexico, sent me down to Bolivia, sent me down to Argentina to serve the poor, to learn about the culture of the people I have been commissioned to love as we have with so many different uh, people. Our church in Joliet serves those in the Polish community, in the Vietnamese community, in the Korean community, people who are in need of God's love. And when I, have a, when I attend the English as a Second Language program in my parish, and I go into the classrooms and share meals with the people that I serve, it is truly a melting pot of people from so many different places. And I've got to eat so many different foods and I've gotten to gain so many, many pounds in the process that it's a blessing to me to know that the church is very much alive and there are so many different ways that I have learned about the faith from these cultures that I've become a richer person for it. Is it not a blessing for us when we serve other people and we learn of other cultures, that we learn how God can speak in so many different ways and we all become better people for it? So to conclude today's talk, what I would like to do is I'd like to offer a special prayer, a special prayer that encompasses all cultures, that encompasses all people, because we know that God speaks in so many different ways and is so present with so many different people that I'd like to acknowledge that and I'd like to embrace that and hopefully all of us will embrace the various cultures and ways as Pope Francis has told us to do, as the Vatican documents have taught us to do, to make sure that we realize that every person is created as an image and likeness of God and we should treat people that way. Lord our God, as we gather in this beautiful setting, this beautiful setting of nature, we realize that this is how you created the earth, that you created the earth as a gift as a gift we should all embrace, that this gift extends in so many different places, that your Blessed Mother has appeared in so many places, as have you in every church that has a tabernacle with that light, that light that shines forth, that tells us that you are there, that this light can be found in all countries of the world, and this light can be found in the hearts of those who believe, what do we learn? That at a mass you are present on the altar, in the word, in the celebrant, and in the people. And in so many different ways, we see that presence with the people that we encounter, that we never take that presence for granted, that we, by learning from others, by spending time with others, people of different races, people of different cultures, people of different tongues, people of different religions, we learn that you are so present in all of us, that all of us are brothers and sisters. May we embrace that presence. May we learn from others how you speak to us through them. May we continue to embrace this love and share our experiences and our own cultures with the people that we meet. This is our prayer. God bless you all. Shalom um, World TV coming to Europe and coming to England, that's fantastic, so that we can get the message of the good news out to people. I think many, many people of all ages, particularly young people, are searching. They're looking to hear a message in their language in a way that they can understand. And good Catholic media can serve that wonderful purpose of getting that news out there and encouraging and challenging people to find out a little bit more of the story of Jesus, which sadly so many people do not know or have forgotten. So it's great to hear this good news of Shalom World TV coming to the UK. May the Holy Spirit shower his blessings upon your work and your ministry 
in serving evangelization and the spreading of the good news of Christ. Shalom world, God's own channel.